Um, let us begin with prayer on this day of Pentecost. O oh God, on this day you once taught the hearts of your faithful people by sending them the light of your Holy Spirit. Grant us in our day by the same Spirit to have a right understanding in all things, and evermore to rejoice in his holy consolation. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. So Mark 6, we'll pick up on this and kind of zoom through it really quickly because we touched on it just a little bit. We talked earlier about the miracles that Jesus performed in chapter 5. The girl restored to life, Jairus' daughter, uh, the woman who had the hemorrhage and was healed. So we, we go on now and we come to his own country where Jesus goes to Nazareth. And that is his hometown and he goes to his own country, his disciples had followed him there. The Sabbath came, seventh day of the week, beginning to teach in the synagogue. Jesus liked to go to church on Saturday, didn't he? He liked to go there and teach. The synagogue was a gathering place of devout Jews where they could hear the word of God, where they could discuss it, where they had Bible classes. And those meetings went on pretty much you know, all day long where people came together for the purpose of of hearing the word of God and assembling. So this is where Jesus was raised. Uh, this is his hometown. In his ministry, he did not spend a lot of time in Nazareth, and you're gonna see why. There was a good reason for that. But at any rate, he's teaching in the synagogue there, and they were astonished, as the Bible says, and says, where did this man get these things, and what wisdom is this which is given to him that such mighty works are performed by his hands? Now. You have, again, uh, this, this aspect of reading the Word of God, picking up the scroll, because let me ask you this question, too. When people were there in Jesus' time, in their homes or in their gathering places, did they all have Bibles? The answer is no. They didn't have any Bibles. See, we tend to think of this during the Reformation when you hear these people describe, during the Reformation, they chained the Bible to the lectern at the church and nobody had Bibles. They actually had better access to Bibles at the time of the Reformation than they did at Jesus' time. And the reason is quite simple, logistics. You didn't have scrolls. You didn't have the vellums in your house. Those were in the synagogue or, say, in the temple, the gathering places. Uh, you couldn't afford to pay a scribe to run the copy machine. Right? This is the copy machine, his hand. Yes. So that's something significant that I think we forget about, that the people did not have the Bible in their hand at Jesus' time. So in other words, to hear the word of God read or expounded upon, they needed to go where those scrolls were actually located. And you can read in Luke's gospel, for example, where Jesus would go into the temple and pick up the scroll and read from Isaiah and then expound upon it. So that's something I think that's significant. You have the other aspect here of what I call um, expository preaching or teaching. It, it really was expository. And in some ways we've kind of lost that, I think, in our churches today. Luther did a lot of this too, where you would take the text and then break it down. So you would read, you would read the bare text first, and, and then you would do the exposition on it. And that's something significant that Jesus did as a teacher. So they heard him, by the way, you never have, um, this is something liturgically I've thought of too. You know this practice of having women read scriptures in services? That's very common in LCMS churches. I've raised this concern to say, well, number one, the Bible says that the woman should remain silent, should not speak in the public assembly, should not have a teaching position. So it goes counter to scripture. But I thought about precedent too, because you think about the argument of precedent. In the Bible, you don't have accounts of women picking up the scrolls and reading them in the synagogue or in the temple, do you? Okay, or, or expounding upon it either. And that's something that I think is you know, significant with that too. Um, by the way, in America, do you know who the, the earliest um, groups were that kind of breached this whole thing and really pushed the women preachers and the women teachers? Which group? Quakers? Um, you're wearing the color today. It's actually the Pentecostals. Oh. The Pentecostals were like the big group. You know, the Amy Semple McPhersons, people, the Catherine Kuhlmans, okay? And, and they use the book of Joel, I will pour out my spirit upon your sons and daughters. See, the Holy Spirit came upon all people. So if any of you were involved, where's Anita? The uh, Pentecostal church, yeah, very common to have women ministers in the Pentecostal church, isn't it? Yeah. Anita will be here next week. She'll be here next week, okay, good. 
So uh, you think about that. Um, I just wanted to mention that. It's kind of an aside, but at least to tuck it in your little toolbox there when this question does come up. So what's the answer to this? Where did this man get these things? And what wisdom is this which is given to him that such mighty works are performed by his hands? So there were two things there. It was the teaching of Jesus and the deeds. They asked, where did he get these teachings? And the second thing was his deeds. In other words, they knew of his miracles. So he always accompanied the miracles, the healings, the raising of the dead, the casting out of the demons. It always accompanied his, um, his work. And so when we get to the feeding of the 5,000, the feeding of the 4,000, there's something interesting. And you think about the divine service that took place there, the liturgy that took place in the feeding of the 5,000, the liturgy of the church back then. It always had those two elements, didn't it? You had the teaching and then you had the action. So you had that sacramental aspect of these things as well. So you had the word and then the action that comes uh, with it. So where did he get these things? Why did they ask that question? Well, it explains it here coming up when it says, um, is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary and brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon, and are not his sisters here with us? So they were offended at him. So carpenter, um, woodworker, but those who fashion things together, wood and stone, it, it could have also been that he was a home builder. Because quite frankly, what can you do if you're a carpenter? Well, you can build chairs maybe and tables and things like that. But that word tecton in Greek would have been somebody who fashioned things together, wood and stone, um, homes. And it would not have been inconceivable that Jesus built houses. He worked for Habitat for Humanity, right? I always wonder why they didn't just translate it as craftsman. A craftsman. Um, a lot of things. Yeah, so the Greek word is tecto, okay? And, and so we can kind of understand that a little bit. By the way, has anybody run into Dan Braz lately, Habitat for Humanity? Dan used to attend this church very faithfully. Yeah. I haven't seen Dan or heard from him. I've got to find out what he's up to. Um, he may have hung up his hammer, but I don't know. Tectone, uh, we get the word architect, you know, that's kind of a derivative of that too, but a tectone is somebody who does something technical, or a craftsman, as you say, Jay, that puts things together. So when we think of Jesus, when I was a kid, I always saw this picture of Jesus with a plane and little curls of wood, right? Remember that in Sunday school? And that was, yeah, he was, worked in his carpenter shop, you know, with his father. But uh, I, th I think it means much more that, you know, he actually worked with his hands and would have been a builder of homes and things of that nature. Yeah, um, yeah, you know, tools and things like a tradesman, okay? Um, a, a carpenter, now, do you think they were speaking favorably here? No, not really. It's like this guy, you know, uh, cuts wood and builds houses, and now he's acting like a big shot theologian, right? It's kind of a put down, wasn't it? Like, what in the heck are you doing, right? You, you should belong to the carpenter's union. You can swing a hammer and wield a saw very well, but now you're actually doing these things of teaching and a theology. They just didn't get this, okay? Big contrast. Well, yes, Jerry? We, we never hear anything in Scripture about Christ, uh, how do I want to put this, going to school. <laughs> right. He never attended any right. kind of synagogue teaching or anything, at least we have no record of any of that. So you can imagine how, what, where did this guy get this stuff? Mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. they know, they knew him probably well enough that they knew he was not educated in the, in the common sense of the term. Yeah, so, and then you've got, um, what's interesting too is how old is he when he did this? See, that's, that's an interesting thing. So Jesus is born, and, and, and certainly they would have known this little baby boy that Mary and Joseph brought home, right? That would have gone to, uh, you know, to the synagogue school, uh, taught by his parents and things like that too. But you had this going on for 30 years, right? With, with, with really what happened during those 30 years? Well, even in scripture, we only have one account at age 12. Mm -hmm. and Luke tells us in the temple, right? Mm -hmm. Going about my father's business. Now, the assumption is that Jesus went to church every Saturday, right? He went to catechism class with the rabbis, right? That he participated in all that fully. He was circumcised. He participated in the sacrifices. He would have been right there with Mary and Joseph. They were devout people. So Jesus was religious in that sense, you know, a good Christian boy, right? 
He went to church every Saturday, right? Went to catechism, studied the Bible. He prayed, right? He knew his father. He was very pious, very devout. But did he do any miracles? Not during, Not during those 30 years, see? He didn't raise any dead. He didn't... Uh, there, there's really no account of him teaching authoritatively, except that account when he's 12 and saying, it must be my father's house, where he was kind of like a child prodigy, kind of expounding on the scripture. That was amazing, wasn't it? You know, the teachers of the law were really, really impressed with him. So he would have had a reputation as a pretty sharp guy, right? Uh, you know, a good Jewish boy with a good head on his shoulders. But you don't have any of the miracles, any of the signs done until he's baptized. And then he's baptized, he begins his ministry, and Luke tells us that and when we know his ministry was began at age 30 and then continued three years just from the chronology. But during that time, then definitely you have these kind of things occurring where he's speaking with authority, he's teaching. He's, he never told people to follow him before he was 30 years old. But after his baptism, he said, come follow me. And he expounded on the, the kingdom. So yeah, that's a good point. And I've thought about that too. Um, you know, well, why didn't he start in earlier? Why didn't he start at 21? Okay, things like that. Um, but there's a lot of thought to that maturity, growth, establishing your credentials. Um, one of the things was, uh, let's see, what was the cutoff for, um, what was the retirement age for the um, Aaronic priesthood? I think it was 50, if I remember right, right? It was forced mandatory retirement at 50 for the priests of the Old Testament because they, it was kind of envisioned they would serve for a particular amount of time and then they wouldn't have the vigor to be able to do that then too. So um, anyway, that's what he does. And so it's astounding. Um, also, the other thing about this, too, is you have not only this familiarity breeding contempt, but you also have this opposition. You have this growing opposition to Jesus, which was occurring elsewhere, but especially in his hometown. And it's um, you look at this. He's, he's got these brothers. OK. Um, and it, so uh, none of the four brothers believed in him. Um, John tells us that. James and Jude believed in him after the resurrection. Uh, James saw the resurrected Lord. We have his epistle, uh, Jude. The sisters of Jesus are unnamed. We don't know what his sister's names were, and they're unnumbered as well. So we don't really know of them. They took offense. Uh, did Jesus give offense? No, but they took offense at his words and his actions. So when you look at Jesus again, the offense is always going to be towards his teachings and his uh, deeds, and they just did not accept him as the Messiah, as the Son of God. So what Jesus does is comes back to them and says, a prophet is not without honor, except in his own country, among his own relatives, and in his own house. So he teaches them the, the aspect here of being without honor, because it was the familiarity breeds contempt. I don't know any other way to put that. It was just not, they were not impressed with this. Uh, verse 5 says he could do no mighty work there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. Um, that's an interesting phrase. Could he have done the works? Well, yes, but he chose not to. He, he chose to restrain himself because he didn't want to give these signs of his deity to those who scoffed at him. Yeah. And, and so to where he gave the gifts freely, he showed himself to be the son of God. But if people demanded something of Jesus... He typically did not acquiesce. If they demanded of him something, he said, no, I'm not going to play a game with you. So you either believe my word or you don't. I'm not going to, you know, kind of, you know, do this. It's almost like extortion, right? Unless you do this, I won't believe in you. Well, the same thing exists even today then that people say, well, I'm not going to believe in this God unless I really get some proof or have some sign from him. And what does God do? Well, God gave us the sign, and the sign is the resurrection of Jesus, right? Because he said, you want this sign, here it is, it's Jonah. So I've already gone down and I've come up. So what, what more do you want? Uh, I don't know, you know. So that's how God operates. And so what he did was um, he, he backed off, really, and he marveled because of their unbelief. Again, it's stubborn unbelief, uh, resistance. And, and yet, that, you see this contrast in the Gospels, because in his own land, he's not accepted, but among the outsiders, they love him. And they embraced him, and they believed in him as the Son of God. So he goes about the villages in a circuit, teaching around the periphery there. And again, he's doing those things. He's always doing this. He's always teaching, and he's always doing this with deeds. So 
in the church today, you think about, well, what is the role of the church today then? You know, why are we here? Why has God placed us here in the midst of all this? The purpose of the church is to catechize, to teach, right? That's what the church always does, right? And, and, through, and the witness, because you have, today is the day of Pentecost, and so uh, appropriate to wear red today. And uh, if you don't have red, it's okay. I wear basic black. It reminds me of sin. It's always in season. But, um, you know, the day of Pentecost was to empower the Holy Spirit would come upon you, and you will be my witnesses. Jerusalem, Judea, the other most parts of the earth. So here we are in Chico, California, witnessing to people. And so I've been inviting people to church this Sunday on Pentecost Sunday. What a great day to come together to witness to the Holy Spirit who calls attention to Jesus. And, and there they were in the upper room. See, we forget that too. You know when they were in that room? That was the same upper room, wasn't it? That they had rented or whoever it belonged to. Okay, it was an Airbnb, I think. Okay. And they were together, no distancing required, no mass required. And they came back, you know, 50 days later to that same upper room, and there the Holy Spirit descended upon them, and they heard each other speaking in their own native tongues. It was not gibberish. It's not gibberish. Any Pentecostals here? <laughs> Shucks. Well, I mean, that's, that's the Pentecostal church today. It teaches gibberish, basically, yeah, unintelligible tongue. But that's not what tongues were. Tongues were a basic communication to spread the gospel to people who came from all over, because who was gathered in Jerusalem on Pentecost means what? The 50th day. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. People say, day of Pente it has nothing to do with the Holy Spirit. You know that? The word Pentecost has nothing to do with the Holy Spirit. It just happened to be the day that the Holy Spirit was poured out. But Pentecost means the 50th day. It was the festival of weeks, which is the 50th day. It was a spring harvest festival. And devout Jews, well, I'm stealing some thunder from the sermon, they would come together and they would assemble. So you had all these Jews there, and Peter preaches to them. The Holy Spirit comes upon the apostles, and they became bold witnesses to the resurrection. That's what they're doing. So we are now bold witnesses to the resurrection of Jesus, that he was killed, he was crucified, and now he's been raised, and we're telling that to the whole world. And people still need to hear that in, in today's world, just like they did then. And so that message never changes, and, and that's what Jesus did by sending out the 12. So let's jump into that. Now this, this coincides a little bit with what we've been doing in Matthew on Thursdays as well. Calling the 12 to himself. These are the 12 apostles again. Sending them out two by two. Uh, the, the interesting thing about this is Jesus wants them to go out two by two, to learn from him, to take an active role, but to depend on one another for help. So Christians never go out alone. They always have some system of backup. And, and, and that's a good thing for us to realize too. We do this today two by two and to give them power over unclean spirits. Um, the only people we send out one by one is our pastors, <laughs> right? <laughs> You know, but Jesus sent his pastors out two by two, which was good. They had a little cover. They had a little protection, okay? So it's, it's fascinating. Uh, and he sends them out. Again, send them out. The Greek word is apostale, which means to send out. That's what apostle means. That's a basic definition of the word apostle. We encountered the word apostle in Matthew. But we encounter that, that verb here in verse 7 where it says that he, he not only called them uh, to himself, but he sent them out. And, and he sends them out to do what? What are they to do? Okay. He gives them power over unclean spirits. So you have the demonic aspect, which is something that's huge in this because wherever you have Jesus, you know who's right behind? Satan, right? So wherever you have the gospel preached in your church, you can be certain that Satan will be right there opposing this. So he calls the 12, sends them forth, apostalen, they are apostles, and gave them authority over the spirits. Now that's plural there, pneumatone, which means that you can't see these things. They are, um, well, they're called spirits, aren't they? So what are they? They're angels, right? They're angels. They're evil angels. They're demons. You can't see them. Um, I've seen pictures of the coronavirus in an electron microscope. Have you seen it? Mm -hmm. Have you looked at the coronavirus? Mm -hmm. It's beautiful. Mm -hmm. God did a good job designing it. Seriously, okay? Think about it, right? If you looked at it, it's a sphere. It's got the red protein spikes on it. It's, red. it's, it's a work of art. It really is. It's got red spikes. <coughs> okay? Depending on who's, who's doing the graphics. 
Mm. Um, well, these are actually pictures from electron microscopes. And I found out electron microscopes were invented in 1931. Mm -hmm. So they didn't have that advantage with the Spanish flu. But if you see pictures of it, National Geographic's got a lot of stuff out lately. It's actually very beautiful. And I couldn't help but think, the angel of light, Lucifer, the be most beautiful angel, right? So here you have this, what does virus mean in the, uh, in the, the Greek? virulent. It means poison. That's what virus means. It means poison, right? It, it's poison. And I think to myself, well, this thing's really beautiful. Take a look at it sometime, right? It, it's impressive, isn't it? Tell me if I'm wrong. It's kind of neat looking, okay? Mm -hmm. And yet I think to myself, it's not even a living organism. It's not alive. It's not dead, right? It's, Genetic material it's code. Yeah. It's code. It's code is all it is, right? Genetic it's just a code, okay? It's got genetic material. It's got RNA in it, okay? And it gets in there, and it, but it's almost like it's got a brain to itself, right? It's got a design. And I think, well, who could have done that? Who designed the viruses? Who made the viruses? God did, right? So, you know, the, so the question is, when you look at pandemics and these diseases and all these things that come from these things, you know, where do these things come from, right? How did this happen? Where do these things, you know, emanate from? And, and we look at this. And the only answer is, what? well, here's the question, what causes this thing? It's sin, isn't it? Sin is the answer. That we have a theological viewpoint of these things it's called the fall into sin. And in the Garden of Eden, the coronavirus, okay, that, that had a good, useful purpose, just like bacteria has a good, useful purpose, right? It's not always good to wash your hands, is it? It's not always good to use antibiotics, right? So there's beneficial bacteria, there's beneficial viruses, but... In the fall into sin, this is fascinating to me. If you go back to Genesis and, and ponder this, what happened to cellular life in Genesis? That, that's, it's, it's, you can it, go all over the place with this, okay? So what happened to cellular molecular life in Genesis in the fall into sin is everything we deal with today, right? It's bondage to decay. Bondage to decay, fall into sin, and we, we read it in the Bible as what? Sweat on the brow, pain and childbirth. The day you eat it, you will die. But there's, there's, a, like a, there's really a biological, molecular explanation of all this when you get into it. And so you're kind of looking at that thing and realizing that, you know, that garden was beautiful. That, that snake that came there was a beautiful serpent. That tree of life, the, the tree of knowledge of good and evil was a beautiful fruit, but yet a deadly fruit all at the same time. So I, I pondered this a little bit. The, 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 uh, see, here's the whole thing. See, are we getting better? The politicians tell me, oh, we've got to get better. Right? We can do better. America can do better. No, it can't. You know why? There's a law in physics. It's called the law of entropy. Right? Now, what is entropy? You're living examples of it. Decay. Yeah. <sighs> Things work out. You wind down. Yeah. It's fall apart. You're, you and I are living examples of entropy. Right? The laws of entropy. Right? You know what that means? <laughs> You know what it means. Yeah. So you go to your doctor and you have a physical and he says, I'm in perfect health. And I say, not bad for a dying man, right? Yeah, you're dying. Yeah, you're dying. So you ponder that a little bit too, but you look at the world. The fall into sin helps us put a theological, and this is the part that it's really kind of bad in a lot of ways. Um, who's, the, um, who's the director of the NIH? Um, Dr. Francis... What's his name? The gray-haired fella with the glasses. Fauci? No, no, not Fauci. Of the people. No, Francis. Um, no, he's a Christian. You probably know him. He's, he's, he's very famous, okay? He's a believer. Um, Definitely not Fauci. Uh, no, it's not Dr. Fauci. No, it's, it's Dr. Francis. Um, help me out here. Gosh, he's really good. Um, who interviewed him recently? Um, anyways, if you, if you want to listen to him, go to YouTube, and he does some great expositions on a Christian point of view on this whole thing. Um, oh, gosh. There he is. Francis Collins. Dr. Francis Collins, okay? Yeah. So, you know, um, the Human Genome Project, okay? So there he is, okay? This didn't come up real well, but there, there he is. Okay, you, re, you probably recognize him, Dr. Francis Collins, okay? Oh, yeah. yeah, okay, yeah. So um, look him up and listen to him um, on that. But he's a Christian, he's a believer, and he, he's done some exposition on this. He's the uh, NIH, um, what's his position with NIH? 
anyway. I think he's the director of the NIH. I'm not sure. Okay. But anyway, he, he talks about this, and he has a lot of YouTube videos out there. You can look him up. You know, Dr. Francis Collins will put this up here. But he will talk about the, the sin aspect. Dr. Francis Collins, MD. Okay, and it's NIH. And I'm not sure what his position with the National Institutes of Health is. But he talks about this. Um, uh, Answers in Genesis is another good resource on this. I hardly recommend Answers in Genesis, um, Dr. Ken Ham, and others like that, too. To, this is what we're kind of lacking in our world today. So when we look at the entropy of the world, we're not getting better. We're not improving, okay? America is not getting better. America is disintegrating. The world is disintegrating. We are falling apart at the seams because you and I are falling apart at the seams, right? And, and so people ask about these things and look at the world and think that, you know, we're going to have a political answer to these things, and it's not going to happen. There's only one answer, and you think about it, and here you are. You know what the answer is, right? Okay, thank you. So I tell people, this is not God's first pandemic. Relax. He's pretty good at this, isn't he? He's got a lot of experience, right? Study the Bible? The other day, a lady asked me, are we in Revelation yet? I said, hey, those horses left the gate a long time ago, lady. You know, those four boys have been riding for a long, long time, right? Okay, you know, right? Um, no, they, they are. I told her. You, we, she said, really? Well, when did we get into Revelation? I said, um, it's called Bethlehem. It was called Calvary, Right? called the coming of Christ, right? right? Well, I think she's uh, leaning towards millennialism. So yeah, here we go, okay. Oh, the millennials love this kind of stuff. I'm going, wait a second, you know what? You, you look at this, it was inaugurated with the coming of Jesus. Read Matthew 24, the wars and the rumors of wars, the pestilence, right? Read Luke 21, when all these things happen, lift up your heads for your redemption draws near. It was inaugurated eschatology when Jesus came in the first time, and it's all been occurring. So, you look at this aspect of the fall into sin in the world. So this is not God's first pandemic. He's very much active, calling people to himself. But Satan is also very much active, too. And Satan is using every opportunity. And that's why we must pray, put on the armor of God, and pray for one another. Because Satan is using this opportunity to take people away from Christ. And I can see examples of this where he's pulling people away from the church. And it's a satanic pull away from Christ and his word. Okay, and that, that's, that's true. Now, this is not to judge somebody who's staying away for medical reasons. Don't get me wrong on that, okay? Don't go out here and say, Pastor said you're following Satan if you don't come to church. Well, you might be, <laughs> depending on your circumstances, right? Because if you have no good reason, then you should come to church, okay? Because I see you at Walmart and Lowe's and everyplace else, right? But my point is, do you think Satan is going to squander this opportunity? No, he will do anything he can, won't he? Okay? But so will God, and God's very much at work in this too. So Jesus goes out, sends them, power over unclean spirits, the evil ones, commanded them to take nothing for the journey except a staff, no bag, no bread, no copper in their money belts, but to wear sandals and not to put on two tunics. Travel light. Why travel light? Their preoccupation was not to be with earthly things, but their preoccupation and focus was to be the kingdom. And they were to depend on whom? The church depends on the church, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, you know, the, no soldier serves at his own expense. Uh, the pastors of the church were supported by the church, of the goodness of the believers. And that was something for them to realize, too, that they were supporting the church, supporting the apostles, and the provisions of God through vocation. All right? So that's where you have the whole issue of hospitality coming into place here, too. And he tells them, whatever place you enter a house. Now, again, this is the, the instance of going into a house, a dwelling place. You stay there till you depart from that place. So when they would go out on the circuit and spread the word of God, they were to enter a house and actually stay there as a place of hospitality. And whoever will not receive you nor hear you when you depart from there, shake off the dust under your feet as a testimony against them. Now, we learned this from Matthew, but dominantly they were sent to the Jews, right? That was the focus. But there was a lot of hostility from uh, the Jews against, uh, you know, uh, Jesus. It really was. Um, and, and it still exists even, you know, today. Um, 
tremendous hostility again. How many, how many of you know, know Jewish people, and you think about this even in America today, where the dominant you know, mindset of the Jews is to reject the Messiah, Jesus. Yeah. Um, and uh, To accept him, it's going to be a high price for them to pay. Oh yeah, yeah, they'll be shunned. So if you know any Jewish people, you know, for them to embrace Christ, the Messiah, it's, yeah, it's, it's a very steep price to be paid for that too. So you ponder that today too. And in America, basically being Jewish is your ethnicity, right? Mm -hmm. And among most Jews, you know, they're, they're, being Jewish is their ethnicity. Right. But you know what their religion is? Atheism or liberalism. Mm -hmm. That's the Jews' religion, atheism or liberalism, right? Do you know any Jews that believe in God? Very few Jews believe in God. Very few Jews, yeah. Most of them believe in liberalism, progressivism, whatever you want to say, um, you know, that type of thing. And uh, so, which is very, very sad when you ponder that and think about, you know, the outreach to the Jewish people and, and what the church needs to do to reach them with the gospel of Jesus Christ. So they encountered that. Uh, he says to them, it'll be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah. Well, how tolerable was it for Sodom and Gomorrah? There was no toleration, was there? They were destroyed. But you look at the degrees of judgment. Now, we talk about the degrees of glory, right? Are there degrees of judgment? Yes. There's levels of accountability, levels of responsibility than for that city. So they have a higher level of accountability because they had the gospel and they rejected it. Well, what about the church today then? What is our accountability in the judgment? Well, our accountability is if you hear the gospel and you have it, you squander it and reject it, you know, he said it's going to be more tolerable, which there was no toleration for Sodom and Gomorrah, who were destroyed for their wickedness in the day of judgment, than for that city. Isn't that interesting? So degrees of glory, degrees of judgment, all of that on the day of judgment, that he warns them and says, you know what, you better listen and pay attention to this, because they had the gospel right in front of them, and, and they squandered it. So... Much the same situation we think about in our churches today with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And, and this is interesting, too. Um, I'll tell you an observation that Jerry Lennon told me the other day. I didn't see that seven-on-seven seven clip. It was about ten seconds if you yeah. blink your eyes, you know. It's typical stuff, you know. So, okay, yeah. Media, right? Yeah, okay. And I was glad for it. You know, it was a good testimony. Father Hansen had a little more extended outreach there. But Jerry and I were talking about this, and this is my take on it, okay? That in this pandemic... The churches that are eager to open and the churches that are conducting services and serving people are generally more conservative traditional churches. And the liberal progressive churches are very reluctant to open and don't want to open, right? Generally true. I'll be curious if you can give me some reports on Chico. I kind of, um, Pleasant Valley was open last week illegally, right? Pastor Rule, okay. But he's, he's pretty orthodox, pretty hard charger, okay, biblical. Father Hansen is open at St. Augustine's. Um, there's a church at Hawthorne and Moss called Redeemer. They're open today. Um, I don't know of any other ones, but if you hear about it or you see any signs or know of this, I'm just curious. I'm kind of pegging this, okay? And I think what happened the other day, there was one local Episcopal church who will go unnamed, and, and after President Trump made the announcement last Sunday, which actually brought one of our members to Redeemer, right? Because our member said, well, President Trump said the churches are open. And that's why this person came last Sunday. So would the Evangelism Committee please send President Trump a thank you note that he heralded the churches? But this is what I'm seeing, okay? This is my observation. If you ask me, well, which churches are opening, they tend to be the more orthodox conservative churches Whereas the more liberal type churches, and, and then, by the way, when they interviewed that priest, you could tell he was kind of miffed because when the president said, and I know this church and I know this priest, very liberal, okay, you probably know which one it is. They, they, they would never, you know, even want to give some inkling that what President Trump said was right, you know, or give any concession to that, right? And that's, like, oh, we're, we're, these, we're just not ready. We got to prepare. We got to prepare. I hear this all the time, okay? And I'm thinking to myself, wait a second, guys, you know. Well, how hard is it to pull out puke cushions? How hard is it to take books out? That's, that's basically your preparation, right? Mm -hmm. So the other day, our leadership met. How long did it take us to prepare the church to open? About an hour, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, about an hour. And I told that to somebody else, and they said, oh, man, an hour? They said, our church has been talking about this for weeks, and we still haven't got to a point where we've done this. Okay, Jake? I was walking the dog the other day, and uh, on, on weekends, I'll, I'll go up to the parking lot of this Baptist church nearby. And yesterday, the, uh, the pastor was out there trimming the trees <laughs> because they have their services in the parking lot, and uh -huh. they've been doing that. Mm -hmm. 
and they're going to keep doing it for I don't know how long. Well, that's good. I mean, that's good. Um, you know what? And then the other thing's going to come out here, too. How many churches kept going under the radar? Yeah. You know, there's a lot more than you realize, too. Okay. But anyway, it's just interesting to look at this. You can write a book on this and a little analysis. It's kind of interesting because I have people all the time asking me, well, is your church going to open up this Sunday? So, well, why not? Right? But I know some LCMS churches that are not open today. So in case you're curious, okay? Now, some of that depends on the county, right? Mm -hmm. Some of that depends on the county. In, in fairness, we need to say that. But in general, I've kind of picked up on this too, that the pastors that like to be a YouTube star are reluctant to open their doors. And they're not big on visitation either. These are pastors who generally aren't big on doing visits to hospitals and nursing homes. They're kind of, you know, like I say, I call them YouTube stars, okay? It's kind of a thing. Uh, again, I'm not against online services. I think they have a place, but in my estimation, a very limited place for homebound people, for sick people, that type of thing. And so I did the one YouTube on Easter. Thank you, Aaron, for doing that. Yeah. That's kind of a concession, but it felt very artificial. It didn't feel real. Um, you know, what was that term I used, Jay, and the, the staged or something like that, you know, okay. where you talk about this. And I didn't even mean that it was staged in the sense of being phony or false, but it was almost like you're kind of on a stage kind of doing something. Although it was a divine service for those who were present. Bob, you were there. And, and uh, yeah. Robert, you were there. You came in late and you dropped your bulletin. And I always remember that you're on YouTube, you know, picking up your bulletin under the pew, you know. And so you get all that on tape, which is kind of interesting. It's like one take, you know, you don't get a second chance with that. But anyway, you do what you have to do, but Jesus sent his apostles out in person, and that's what we need to do as the church. And I'm very much insistent on this, too, that the church can only operate in person, right? The church does not operate in cyberspace. The church doesn't operate with virtual communion, virtual prayers, okay? The church operates with the ministry coming together as the body of Christ. And others are telling us, well, see, but the, the state was right. Your church doesn't have your church wasn't really closed because you were still getting the message out via the internet, via you know the AM FM radio. Uh, by the way, I'll never I, I you know okay I'm a big fan of the internet, spreading the word of God. There's the great blessings that come with that and everything too, but never forget the lowly AM FM radio, right? Yeah. Seriously, and I've thanked Andrew Palmquist immensely, profusely for KKXX because our homebound people can listen to KKXX, right? Yeah, and, and they can get a good signal, um, in Paradise particularly, because the transmitter's right there, you know. Um, a, a, FM, actually, you know where, the, the FM's amazing. No, excuse me, I'll take it back, the AM. Do you know that the AM signal hits Rockland or Roseville on the ridge there? Yeah, I told you that before, too. So it does get out to people. So, they went out and they preached. They are proclaiming that people, this is interesting, what should people do? When they hear the message of Jesus, they should repent. What should you do when you hear the message of Jesus? Repent. Do you need to repent, Aaron? Absolutely. Oh, you're a good Christian boy. You go to Redeemer. Repent? No, I don't I'm, think so. That's too strong of a term. Okay? I need absolution today. You need absolution. You do need absolution. And by the way, one of the questions I've asked people, good to see you, Tyson and Bonnie. Um, I've asked people this question. Seriously, ask yourself this question. Why did you come to church today? That's a good question, right? Or why do you want to return to church today? That's a fundamental question. That's a good one I've asked myself too. Why do I want to have a service this morning as a pastor? And there's only one answer. Because I need the forgiveness of sins. Yeah. Right? I need the forgiveness of sins. That's why the church exists. To bestow the forgiveness of sins in and through the gospel of Jesus Christ. Oh, I like to see the people. Well, go to the Rotary Club or the Kiwanis Club, right? They got that. I was going to say they got better people there, but I say, you know what I'm saying, okay, right? Uh, I like the food and coffee afterwards, you know. Well, there's some good restaurants. No, um, my point is, sure you love the people because they're brothers and sisters in Christ. You want to see them, right? But that's not the reason you come to church, right? Uh, you don't go to church to make the weak go better either, you know, superstition. You come because Jesus is present. You want to be among Jesus that people should repent according to verse um, 12 there. That was John's message, and it's Jesus' message. That is very interesting. John's message was repent and believe the gospel, right? That was the message of the forerunner. What was the message of Jesus? Repent and believe the gospel. Metanoia in Greek is the word. Metanoia means with a new mind. 
to have a new mind, that's the word repent, which means you turn around, you change your ways, and you follow Christ. It's called repentance. Okay? By the way, it's a durative verb, which means keep repenting. Mm. Mm. How often do you repent? Daily. You daily. You're living in repentance constantly, and that's something that Christians are always doing. So you repent, and, and implied there, it doesn't say this, but what is implied in verse 12 is the forgiveness of sins. Because, especially when you read the confessions, you talk about repentance, and Luther talked about this. Repentance involves the contrition, the sorrow over sin, right? But it also includes what? You mentioned it, absolution. Yeah, yeah that, that sins are absolved, they're forgiven. You never call people to repent and say, you need to repent of your sin without pronouncing absolution. You absolve them of their sins. You bestow that through the office of the keys. And implied in that, repentance, remember the third element? Amendment of life. You change your wicked ways because it's not cheap grace, right? Third use of the law, when you repent, you change your ways. And then they cast out many demons. There's your aspect of that again. They're continuing the ministry of Jesus. Did Jesus do all these things? Yes. But now they're doing it and anointing with oil many who were sick and healed them. They couldn't do that virtually, could they? They had to do that in person. And so Christian fellowship still practices this. James chapter 5, verse 14 says, If you're sick, you call the elders of the church to come and anoint you and pray over you. You have the rituals for healing in Luke chapter 10. And so you have the aspect of oil being symbolic of medicine, of, of, of balm, of, of healing. And anointing was also something that was done with kings when they were placed into office. So when you're sick, you call the pastor of the church. I know James 5 says, let him call the elders of the church. Well, see, if we were in the early church, they knew what an elder meant, right? The problem is, okay, what's an elder in the church today? J. Irwin. No, 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 you're looking at the elder, right? That's what the Bible teaches. The elder, when you come across the word elder in the Bible, James 5, it means the pastor, right? That's who it is, okay? They're really... The closest analogy we would have would be 1 Timothy 3, actually 1 Timothy 2, well 3, yeah, where you have the deacons, okay, the deacons who were lay men in the church who assisted the pastor, Stephen being the first deacon to take care of the mundane things, and even assisted Holy Communion. So, by the way, that's another one too when you think about, if you want to talk about the male-female um, divisions of labor or the orders of creation, you never had female deaconesses. Now, you had female deaconesses who served the needs of the women, but even early on in the Council of Nicaea, they decreed early on that they would never be in a position of giving communion and assisting the pastor, the priests, with any of that, too. But this, you know, has come up. I and mean, we have LCMS churches with women elders, okay, women functioning, basically, doing pastoral functions, which goes contrary to the Word of God. So at any rate, that's just an aside again, but it is something to consider. So the healing was given to the sick and, and, and the anointing of oil. A big component of Jesus' work was sick people, wasn't it? Why? Because they had viruses, and they had bacteria, and they had strokes and heart attacks and diabetes because that was the fall into sin. He addressed that in a lot of ways. We spend a lot of time with that in the church, don't we, when we pray for people. What you, most of your visitation in the church, who do you visit in the church? Healthy people? If you're healthy, you're not going to get a visit from anybody in the church. I can almost guarantee you that. You know that? That's kind of sad, but it's true, right? If you're healthy, nobody's going to come visit you. But if you're sick, guess what? A lot of people are going to run up to the hospital and come see you, right? That's kind of ironic. I mean, it's good. Don't get me wrong, okay? But I'm just saying that, you know, if you think about it, should not our encouragement, our visitation take place all the time, right? Now, especially to the sick, you know, that type of thing, too. But it's just kind of interesting that uh, Jesus came among the people. By the way, did he go among the healthy people, too? Yes, he did, okay? Because even healthy people have need of the forgiveness of sins. And they cast out many demons, anointed with oil many who were sick, and healed them. So that's a dominant part of his ministry, preaching with the gospel, taking care of the sick. So again, you have teachings of the, the call to repentance, and then you have the deeds, which the deed would have been the healing and the ministry to the body. So it's, it's always a holistic type thing, and that's why the first hospitals, what does the word hospital mean? Hospitality. That's what it means, right? What does hospice mean? Hospice means a place of hospitality, of welcoming, 
okay? Sadly, we've equated hospice with dying care now, but that's not what the word meant etymologically early on. It meant a place where you could be accepted and received. And this is exactly what Jesus did with the people. The Christians established hospitals, orphanages, because they wanted to care for the body. And even today, we want to care for the body. So when you look at these mitigation measures that we have today, you know, we're doing this out of love for our fellow um, brothers and sisters in Christ, maybe unbelievers who come, that we recognize these things. And we're going to take some, you know, precautions. And that's, that's all. Um, it was interesting because we talked about, and you know what, this, this could change things a lot too. I don't know, game changer, only God knows. But we've not done this for flu, for seasonal flu, have we? Have we done any of this for seasonal flu? Institutions have. Nursing homes have done it. Enloe Hospital requires a flu shot for their employees. You always know an employee at Enloe, a nurse, who doesn't have a flu shot because they're required to wear a mask. So you'll see this, but churches haven't done this. My question is, is this going to be the normal way of doing things now forever in the church due to this? That we're going to look at even seasonal flu next year or different too. We might be doing this for a while. Okay, yeah, I'm just thinking out loud here on this whole thing, too, because of this, you know, uh, situation that we have now. But we haven't typically done this for seasonal flu. You know what we've done with seasonal flu in the church? Basically, you've been on your own, right? You stay home. That's what we've done, right? We didn't change the communion practice. We didn't put tape on the pews. We didn't do anything for seasonal flu. But every year, seasonal flu killed 30 to 50,000 Americans, right? Pretty significant number. But nobody really raised any issues over that, did they? It's kind of interesting. Yeah, it's just inside, okay? And you can say, well, there's some differences here, and there are, okay? But my point is, when you look at the ministry of Jesus, the health concerns, the sickness, the demons. And by the way, demon possession was, had physiological effects on the person. Because what the demons did was take control, right? And they caused them to convulse and to have seizures and, uh, and other things, manifestations. So there's a demonic aspect of this, too, and this fall into sin. And if you, if you follow uh, Collins there, the doctor, and you look at that, you look at this fall into sin, and you go back to the garden, and you say, this had an effect on a very basic cellular, molecular level in the human body, and, and affects all of us. See? The, the laws of entropy and the fall into sin. So you're never going to overcome this. And so when you look at these manifestations in the world, and they're all over the place. So wars and rumors of wars, right? This is nothing new, right? We're experiencing this in our country, but never forget the deadliest war we ever fought was on our own soil. And over 600,000 Americans died in the deadliest war in the 1860s. So uh, you ponder that, the Spanish flu of 1918 and 1919, how many Americans died in that? 675,000. Apparently, one third of the world's population wiped out, right? Okay. Um, you, you, you ponder these things. Uh, I, I thought about the hymn, and I was singing it this morning, the great hymn, and it's not a Thanksgiving hymn. Do you know that? People, we sing it at Thanksgiving, but it's not. Now thank we all our God. You know what that hymn is? That's a pandemic hymn, isn't it? Now thank we all our God. You know why it was written? Because of the pandemic, the 30 years war. Martin Rinkert wrote that hymn, and so these pastors, I was kind of curious because I always ask myself, well, what do pastors do during a pandemic, right? What do lay people do during a pandemic? So I went back and studied some of this. Some of this I gave you. What did Luther do in 1526 during the great pandemic and the plague in Wittenberg? Well, pastors were given a choice. They could have done two things. They could have gone out in the country because it's always better to live in the country, isn't it? No, seriously, it was healthier in the country. Bubonic plague. Uh, Luther chose to hunker down and stay in Wittenberg and at, at great risk and peril, okay? And so um, I, I think about that too. Thank you for your prayers because I know I'm at risk with the heart situation and my constant exposure, okay? And so uh, I thank you for your prayers because pastors are always exposed. Um, the, the, <laughs> I tell people, pastors are on the front line and the finish line of life, you know, in a lot of ways, okay? So we're grateful, you know, for that. But 
And when Rinkert wrote this hymn, you had the Thirty Years' War, you had the Peace of Westphalia that finally kind of, kind of put an end to this. Um, he had this big, they had the big negotiation there in Eilenburg with the Swedes, because remember Gustavus Adolphus got involved in this whole war, and that was all kind of a big mess, okay? But then the plague came in, Rinkert lost his wife, there were four pastors in town, and he was the last man standing. And they said that he did 50, 60 funerals every day when the pestilence came in there to Eilenburg. He, he uh, only lived to 63, same age as me. He wore himself out. He was he's dead, basically, you know, uh, poor guy. But he was a believer. He was a confessional Lutheran. Um, he was an archdeacon at one time. Uh, he studied in, in Leipzig, a great theologian. And you love his hymn, Now thank we all our God. It's not a Thanksgiving hymn. Don't sing it at Thanksgiving. Well, sing it at Thanksgiving. But it was a pandemic hymn. That's why he wrote it. People don't understand that, the context of these great hymns. And that's why he sang it, to give thanks to God for all of his blessings, even in the midst of this. So I want you to do one favor of God and me. Give God thanks today for the pandemic. Would you thank him? Because he is using this for his purposes, okay? He, all things work together for good, is what scripture says. Thank God for this pandemic. Thank God for what has happened to our congregation, right? Thank God for what has happened to you. You thank God for allowing that fire to come through, right? Okay, because it destroyed your home, but God was right there in the midst of it doing his good work, right? Okay, and I thank God that our Savior Lutheran Church burned down, right? Because I give him thanks in all things, and I rejoice in the Lord always, and I rejoice at what our congregation is, is dealing with right now, okay? What I'm going through, what you're going through, and, and you look at me and you think, you're crazy. Well, I know that. <laughs> but what I want you to answer me is, am I scriptural in saying this? That's the only point. It doesn't matter if I'm crazy or not, okay? That's up for debate and drags. <laughs> Same with you, right? Mm -hmm. But my point is, no, seriously, if we look at all these things, if you read Romans 8 and you look at adversities, you know, and America is falling apart at the seams, okay? Our country's going down, down, down. Mm -hmm. And we think an election is going to change these things and, and uh, you know, alter all these things. Have you watched the news lately? What's occurring? L.A., San Francisco, Oakland. I mean, you know, it's just more of the same. Have you seen what's going on in Chico lately? Okay, have you driven around town? Have you gone in the parks? Mm -hmm. Have you tripped over the needles? <laughs> have you seen all these things? Okay, so you look at all these effects, you know. And you say, well, wait a second, God tells me in all these things to give thanks, right? To rejoice in the Lord always and to realize there's one thing that hasn't changed. What hasn't changed? God and his word, right? God and his word, okay? People are suffering, people are hurting, but God and his word, okay? And we're not going to get better, we're going to get worse. Um, I told somebody the other day, Jesus did not come into this world to make bad people good. Jesus came into this world to make dead people alive. That's what he did, right? He didn't come into this world to make bad people better. That's another twist on that. Jesus came into this world to make dead people alive, right? Isn't that what he did? Did he come to change the world, reform the world? Set up a new world order? No. What did he do? He came to die for their sins and to give them life. And we have life in Jesus. And it just so happens that you and I are living on May 31st, the day of Pentecost, in the year of our Lord, 2020. And all I can say is when I read the Bible, and that's why I need it so much too, that I can say this is a very good time to be alive. This is a very good time to be a Christian. It's a great time to be the church because we are the church for this time and this place. I didn't pick this, did you? I didn't plan this, did you? March 19th kind of changed everything quickly, right? when uh, Governor Newsom said, your churches are closed, okay? Okay, so March 15th, we were kind of the holdout, right? Remember that Sunday? Mm -hmm. I haven't seen you for 10 weeks. Where you all been, okay? March 15th, we were the holdout. A lot of churches were shutting down, right? And then all of a sudden, everything changed on the 19th. So here we are, we'll see what happens with all this. But Jesus is sending out his disciples and sending them out to spread the word of the Lord. Now you have this, I'm not gonna take time to read all this right now, but you have this account of um, King Herod and uh, John the Baptist. And this is kind of an interesting thing. It's like a flashback, isn't it? Because what you have is when he hears about Jesus, who does he think he is? He thinks he's John the Baptist mm -hmm. because the ministry was so identical, right? 
And, and so this, this misidentification, uh, uh, you know, John the Baptist, others say it's Elijah. Why? Because Jesus, uh, the Gospels, remember he talks about this, this is Elijah whom I will send. You go to the Old Testament. And others said uh, it's the prophet. Well, who's the prophet? Or like one, that would have been Moses. Okay, yeah. So they thought it was like a reincarnation, which is interesting. But when Herod heard, he says, this is John who might be headed. He has been raised from the dead. Now, that's an interesting one, isn't it? That Herod, who took the head off of John, actually said, thought to himself that maybe he came back from the dead. That's, that's a bit fascinating to me, is it not? Yeah. Um, he had a suspicion, okay? And by the way, when you see, we see uh, this is an interesting thing of politicians. Have you seen this? Have any of you been in a political office? or held one or no politicians, they get very paranoid. They get very insecure, don't they? Okay? Which is why they like power and authority. Okay? Every politician loves power and authority. You know that? I don't care who it is. Right? It's a lot of authority, a lot of power. Okay? But there's also a great deal of paranoia with some of these things, too. And when you look at Herod, that's exactly what he had. This is amazing. Is he a believer? No, he's not a Christian. But he knows he's killed John. And he says, he's been raised from the dead. Now, where would he get that from? Did the Jews believe in the resurrection? Yes. Did Jesus raise people from the dead? Yes. So certainly that thought would have been there. Um, he may have had a dream about these things too. He, so he sends him um, and lays hold of John, uh, bound him in prison. Now, now this is a flashback. You've got to remember this. Okay, This is not chronological, right? So he's just telling you the story here about what happened, the adultery, John the Baptist calls him on it, and then um, you know you have this, this high feast here, and uh, Herodias' daughter comes in and says, the king, well, he made a mistake, he says, I'll give you whatever you want, okay? You, you know what I want? The head of John the Baptist. Yeah, because there again, you had this, this instance, see, you don't want the church, you don't want the pastor, you know why? He got too close to home, right? So I get rid of him, and beheading was what they did, and, and so they get the head of John the Baptist on a platter. Have you ever seen the artwork on this? Yes. Absolutely horrific. Yes, horrible. horrible, okay? You think about this. We read about this, very sanitized. This is a great Sunday school lesson. Mommy, what, what, I learned in Sunday school today they cut the head of John the Baptist off, and my teacher brought in a, a fake head on a platter with ketchup around mm -hmm. it, you know, right? I mean, it's gory. It's horrible, right? But the, these are the things that occurred. Now. Um, he's sorry, okay? He didn't want to refuse her, so he had some qualms about this. But then they, they did this and uh, beheaded him in prison, brought the head on the platter, and the disciples heard of this. They came and took away his corpse and laid it in a tomb. So you had this reverent burial that took place of uh, John the Baptist, which is what Christians did. It was very interesting. When they approached the dead, the dead in Christ, they treated them with great reverence and great respect, just like they did the body of Jesus. So at any rate, that's kind of a review. I don't want to spend time on that because it's like a flashback type of thing. But um, that's the opposition that they were encountering at that time. So you had Jewish opposition and you had uh, Roman opposition, Gentile opposition as well. Does anybody have any questions or comments about this, um, the hostility? And you see the, the rejection is very much there, is it? Jesus was rejected, but you also had utter violence in this case as well. And so you're going to see this violence in your life and mine against Christians. And it's already occurred in your lifetime. It's called World War II, Joseph Stalin, right? It's going to occur again. Who, who was it? One of our elders by the name of Bob the other day said, there was a pastor in Chico back in 2018 that talked about the campfire. Do you remember this pastor? He talked about the campfire in a Lutheran church. And he said, uh, you haven't seen anything yet because there's another disaster coming. Or something to that effect. Who was that pastor, Bob? It might have been you. I don't think it was me. It was somebody else. It was some other pastor back there talking about that, right? But yeah, you have a good memory. You know? But no, I mean, if you read the scriptures, that's what, that's what they say, right? This is not the end. So when will all this end? Even so, come Lord Jesus, right? So if you would pray for Christ to come again, that's the prayer of the church, okay? Pray for the end to come soon, okay? Because this is getting old, isn't it? This is getting tiring. How many of you want to be with Christ in heaven? Pray it happens today according to God's will, okay? So we don't have to go through this anymore, okay? If God wills it. Now, if God, here's the other thing. If God does not will that the end come today, what are we going to do? 
Right, for tomorrow. We're going to spread the gospel, right? That's what we do because you read the Olivet Discourse and you read other portions. He says the end is not yet, but the gospel must be preached to all nations. We're going to continue to preach the gospel and administer the sacraments. That's what Christians do to bring the good news to one another and to the world. Okay, we're out of time, so let us close with prayer. Let us pray. O holy and most merciful God, you have taught us the way of your commandments. We implore you to pour out your grace into our hearts, cause it to bear fruit in us, that being ever mindful of your mercies and your laws, we may always be directed to your will and daily increase in love toward you and one another. Enable us to resist all evil and to live a godly life. Help us to follow the example of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and to walk in his steps until we shall possess the kingdom that has been prepared for us in heaven. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.